Welcome to the Land Geek Podcast, your resource for information and tips to making money by buying and selling land. Let the Land Geek show you how to make a passive income by working smart, not working hard. Learn strategies and tricks to make money buying and selling raw land today. And here is the man that's going to help you do that, the Land Geek. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www thelandgeek.com and today I've got one of the most successful and impressive mobile home park entrepreneurs in the country. Frank Rolf is a big deal. Let me give you Frank's bio here. Frank has been an investor in mobile home parks for almost two decades having owned and operated over 110 110 mobile home parks during that time. He is currently ranked with his partner as the 18th largest mobile home park owner in the U.S. with over 80 communities spread out over 17 states. So Frank is going to tell us his story and journey from being from going from zero to, you know, 120, 110 sites. Uh, Frank graduated from... Economic, as an economics uh, major from Stanford University, a little university maybe some of you have heard of. Um, he is also uh, the chairman of the Landmarks Commission. He lives in a small town in Missouri with his wife and daughter. Land Geek community, let's welcome Frank Rolf. Frank Rolf, how are you? Hey, Mark, thanks a lot. Let me, let me uh, tell you, if you thought those stats were, were impressive, let me give you the current stats. Sure. That bio is even a little old. We've got, uh, we own currently around 140 communities. 140. We have about 14,000 lots. We are now 10th largest in the U.S. Um, so we've, we've, we keep on growing. I think we have 20 parks under contract right now. So we're we'll be maybe up to 160, something like that here, uh, probably by the first quarter of next year. Frank. This is unbelievable. Why mobile home parks? Why not what, you know, the sexy and glamorous DIY, HGTV, fix and flip, or, you know, commercial real estate, or self-storage parks? Why mobile homes? It seems like, I don't know, uh, well, you, you know, tough tough to, to deal with mobile home parks, I would think. Yeah, actually, actually, that's a bad rap mobile home parks get. It's very, very easy business if you can get over the stigma which is a pretty high hurdle for most people. When you think mobile home park, you think trailer park, you think the show Cops, you think Jeff Foxworthy, you think all the nasty things that go on in that poor people world that you don't even want to think about. But that's really not the business. There, there, is, there is that part of the business. And, uh, but the stuff we deal in is a notch up. It's called affordable housing. It's basically we house people that make minimum wage to probably 15 bucks an hour. Uh, the key item is they have jobs. Most of the stuff you see in Jeff Foxworthy and cops, those folks don't have jobs. That's that's the big difference. So they have no money. So they're the true poor of America because they have not a penny to their name and they live on the dole and social programs and borrowing from their grandparents. Our customers have jobs. They've got cars. They've got lives. They've got kids. So when you when you understand and get over the stigma. It's a whole new world. But it takes a while to get over the stigma because we've all been classically trained that trailer parks are filled with poor white trash and we should all avoid them like the plague. So right, that's the, right. So that's, that's not the, the case. Term. I mean, I, I know there's there are some very nice home, like mobile home parks, like in, in Arizona, like really nice. Like you and I wouldn't mind living there. Yeah. Well, if, you, if you'll go, uh, you know, a little bit farther west, you know, Malibu, uh, there, there are two parks in Malibu, Point Doom and – can't remember the other name, and uh, Pam Anderson has lived there on and off. Sean Penn's lived there on and off. Um, the, you know, the the mobile homes there go. They start at half a million, go to two million. Okay. And the rent is about two grand a month. But you're literally on the beach of Malibu. They have one, one of the best locations in Malibu. So you know, it's a, it's a big wide world in trailer parks. There, there's poor people. There's rich people. There's everything in between. Right. Uh, the, the stuff we deal in though is what's called affordable housing. So we're that. Lowest twenty percent of America that uh, you know is struggling to get by, not making a lot, trying to have a nice life, but not having a lot of cash. Sure, but that's a big market. It's a that's really, huge. it's a huge, huge market. So, yeah. when did you get started in this, and how did you get started? Like, what's the story? Uh, I'll, give you, I'll have to give you the long story for it to make any sense. Okay. Uh, 
got out of Stanford, degree in economics, got out a year early by taking extra classes. So I have one year to burn, going to go on to get an MBA. The, the key thing back then, not today maybe, but back in the early 80s, if you were going to apply to Stanford or Harvard Business School, wherever you were going to go, the, the number one thing they liked was for you to start a business and, and have that as one, a piece of your, of your application, right? That was considered the ultimate in book reports, a book report on yourself starting a business, how it went, and then you'd go on to business school. Sure. So I, I, I think that I, still applies today. They want you to have some real-world business experience. There, before there you go. Yeah. Right. So I got one year to kill. So I call people up. Hey, I got one year to start a business. What should I do? People have all these stupid ideas. Start a restaurant. You know, start a rocket factory. Stupid stuff. One person says, billboard business would be good. Doesn't take a lot of capital. And you can shut it down real fast. And you can keep whatever you build at the end of the year. Okay, I thought that sounded pretty smart. I asked other people. They said, yeah, that actually is not a bad idea. Okay. So I jumped into billboards with absolutely no idea what I was doing. And so my goal was to get a few signs. By the end of the, end of the first year, I have three signs. Okay. But I have, I have a bunch more pending. So I decided to wait one more year to apply to business school. You can guess what happened. I never applied to business school, never went to business school. Fourteen years later, I was the largest private owner of billboards in Dallas-Fort Worth. <laughs> Has about 300 billboards. And now the issue is, you know, what, what do I do now? And I think I'm going to just do that the rest of my life. Right. And instead, what happens is I uh, get a call from a public company uh, out of the blue saying, we want to buy you out. Uh, so they wrote me a check for $5.8 million bucks, And I said, here are all my billboards. And I retired. Okay. At the age of 30, 36. And that got really boring for, uh, it, was, it was interesting for about two months. And then it got really depressing and boring, and I realized that retirement is a, is a lousy way to live. So I had to go back in, into something. But I couldn't go back into billboards. I had a non-compete. So I thought, what do I do now? And then I remembered I'd built two billboards on a mobile home park called Glen Haven in Dallas back when I had the billboard business. And the guy used to call me up all the time wanting me to do favors for him. Normally, go by the manager's uh, little trailer, knock on the door, and find out why he would not answer the phone. And normally it was because he was drunk or he was high. Oh, and no. so I felt like I knew this park. So I called the guy up just to ask about the business. And the guy says to me on the very first call, you really need to buy my park. And I said, you know, I, and I'm just, I'm on an exploratory mission. I'm not really into buying a park. And he said, I'll make you a deal so good you cannot say no. And I said, well, how good are you talking? He said, I'll sell you the park for four hundred grand." With ten thousand down, and I will carry three hundred ninety thousand dollars non recourse, fully amortizing over the length of the loan. Wow, that is wow. A, that is yeah. a deal you can't refuse. Yeah, so I can't refuse that deal. So even though I did not intend to buy that park, I said, okay, I, I'll do that deal. And I tell my wife, you know what, I'm going to try this out. This is a ten thousand dollar learning experience because right. you know I'm going to give it back. Right. Because I'm not sure I want to do this. So I get, get, get in there, I, I start going to that park every day, 9 to 5, little trailer inside the park, and uh, after about a year, I think I know the business pretty well, I buy another park, and another park, and another park, and another park, and then the story is I just kept buying parks, and so I got up to 28 parks. At 28 parks, suddenly the world changed, because all these Californian 1031 investors were, were, were swamping the, the world wanted to do these, these 1031 purchases. Sure, sure. And so the cap rates plummeted from about 10% down to as low as 4%. Wow. So I started selling everything off. Yeah. So rapidly as I bought, I rapidly sold everything off. And I, I just like a uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark movie, I slid under the giant stone wall that came crashing down right before the 2007 collapse. So my timing was phenomenal. I, my last park sale was 2006. Wow. So, so I went into the great collapse with no parks at all, okay. no baggage. I uh, did nothing then until 2010 because interest rates, again, nothing, nothing was compelling. Cap rates were awful. Wasn't, nothing good going on. 2010, suddenly cap rates were attractive. Lending was attractive. And I started, started back up buying parks, and then we've just been buying ever since. It's myself, my partner Dave Reynolds out in, out in uh, Colorado, and uh, we've just been you know, buying up good deals now for you know, four years now of just nothing but buying. So just nothing but buying. How big is your organization? Because I would think 
you're going to have to have a due diligence team, someone to go out and well, a management you're, you're, team. And, yes, true. We, 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 have, we have about 200 employees, uh-huh. but every, every park has an on-site park manager. Okay. So there's about 140 of them. Okay. Uh, the rest of them are people in the office who do things like accounting, titling, that kind of stuff. And then we have another group out in the field that manages the managers, and we call them district managers. So okay. you know, if you still look at how, how large we are for such a small group of people, we're, we're still a skeleton staff compared to the apartment industry or you know, most any other industry. Because, again, we just rent land, so we're not... You know, we have a few trailers, but most of what we rent is is land. So it's it's not a very high management thing. Right, right. And, you know, that's my thing is I buy and sell raw land throughout right. southwestern Florida. So I bought a subdivision in Texas. Okay. Uh, goes under, and the POA goes under. And so there's no POA fees, and there's like, let's say, 100 zoned mobile home lots. Right. And I don't know what to do with them. Right. And I'm thinking, oh, and, and right now there's a, you know, there are about 25 mobile home lots. And it's what you were talking about in the very beginning of the podcast. I've got the Jeff Foxworthy group there. Right. So, yeah. you know, it's people go out to that subdivision and they're scared. Right. So I'm thinking to myself, well, what am I going to do? Can I, right. can I buy some inexpensive mobile homes and rent them out and do cash for keys and get the bad element out? So, right. Frank, if you were me, what would you do? If I, if I were you, what I would do is the um, – I mean, you can buy homes from manufacturers such as Legacy where they will self-finance. If you put down a third, they'll finance two-thirds. Sure. There's a company called True, T-R-U, which builds one of the cheapest homes in the U.S. Uh, you can buy, I think, a True Double Wide for under thirty grand. Okay. Wow. And so the one option would be you'd buy the home – the the, the 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 key item you're going to have initially is people who have jobs don't like hanging out with people who don't have jobs. Right. And, and so one problem you have in what you're describing, which is I think called land home, is what we call that animal. Because okay. they own the land, right? Is that how this works? Or would well, they no, I own the land. So, so they would never own the land? Well, technically, I mean, I could, I could do a land home package. I well, don't know. No, I mean, the problem with land home, do you, do you have any... Oh, you mean the people that are there now, do they own the land? Yeah. I yes. don't think so. Oh, okay. I'm not well, sure. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so what you yeah. have to do is you, you have to manhandle people to a certain minimum standard. Right. Uh, or, or you just can't attract people with jobs. And if they don't have jobs, then you're stuck with the Jeff Foxworthy mess. Right. So, so to make that deal work, what you have to do is you'd have to get everybody in there now... Up to a minimum level, all all the dangerous breeds of dogs would have to go. All of the you know rusted, non running vehicles would have to be gone. You'd have to get the yards presentable, the homes presentable. It's just basically paint and a weed eater and a lawnmower and that kind of stuff, so that it's presentable. Sure. And then and then then you'd go more into the marketing phase, and what you do is you'd probably get you know one mobile home. And make use it as a model is one way people do it, just like a single family deal. Right. People come in and say, "Hey, I really like this home," and then you either sell them that home and bring another one in, or you bring one in and maintain that as your model. Okay. Same same thing. Subdivisions work, but the difference is you can have that home there lickety split. Right. It's almost like Walmart. All right. So it's not like yeah, we'll build you one. Let's sign the papers, and you'll have your dream home in a year. This would be like sign the papers, and you have your home here in a week. In a week. Yeah, Unbelievable. It, yeah, but, so yeah, so but, and I'm not doing the financing on the home. I'm just renting out my my land. Well, you would it depends on the quality of your customer, right? If they're okay. a decent quality customer, they could get their own financing through 21st century mortgage or Vanderbilt or something. If they are, you know, minimum wage people, you probably have to you, you would probably have to do the financing. Okay. In that case, you could go through legacy and they would finance two thirds just on your signature and yes. you would put up one third of it. So that that's kind of what you would do with that, I think. Okay, but I've you, never, never, I've never seen it. But I mean, I, that's just kind of how what it sounds like, right? But this is different from your model. Your model is, is you're going to an model. established mobile home park, right? And you're buying it at a certain cap rate, right? And typically then, ten. yeah, and then you're taking, uh, you know, you're you're making it better, you're improving it, and you've got a cash flow. 
Right, right. That's that's correct. I mean, what what we typically do is we try and find what we call a stabilized with upside park. That's a park that's done. It's finished. Probably built in the nineteen sixties to the eighties. Right. Already has a tenant base, and we groom it. So we we don't start off at zero. We start off with a park that may be sixty to eighty percent occupied. We go in and clean it up, get rid of the bad people, bring in nice people, fill some lots, raise the rent, clean it up. That's the model. It's, it's just classic mobile home turnarounds is what it is. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And how competitive is that market? I mean, how tough is it for you to get deals? I mean, it sounds like you're dominating this niche. Well, it's, you got to understand that our because of that hurdle, I mean, you know, if you look at single family and other things where there's no stigma, Right. It's not hard to get people turned on to it. So right. if I if if I said, Hey, I, I flip houses, people think I could flip houses, I live in a house, I know houses, I can do this. Right. When you say mobile home park, how many people are willing to like climb over that stigma? You know, not many. Most people say, God, trailer park, I drove through one once, I was terrified or yeah. I saw cops last week. Oh, it's a terrible idea. Right. So it's it, it, that's why there's not much competition. Most people are terrified of the idea. Right, and so that's that's why we can find so many parks. I mean, if you go to mobile home park store dot com as an example, you'll have in any given day eight hundred to two thousand parks on there for sale. No so imagine kidding. Big, big Neiman's catalog of like one to two thousand items for sale, right there. But you wouldn't touch those. Right? No, we do. We buy a lot of those. Oh, you would. Okay. Yes, okay. we do. The, the I mean, you, you can. It's it's one of the few real estate niches where you can pop up a huge amount of volume really, really fast. Okay. And and again, why is that? It's just people are terrified of the industry. I mean, it's just it's, there's no other reason than that. It would be no different than these folks that, that you know retire on their social security to some of these foreign countries and live like a king. Sure. I know some people have done that, and you know, I'd be terrified to do that. Yeah, but I mean, I you know, so they they think you know that you're crazy not to do it because you can you know li- live like you're making a million a year in the Philippines on a grand a month, right? But why can they do that? Because the hurdle is so high. I mean, if Americans start pouring into the Philippines, it'd be the price of all the homes up hugely, and the opportunity would be lost. Same in this. It's just we we have this giant, you know, iron wall which is like about nine feet high of mobile home parks and how people are so afraid of them so they won't climb over the wall. Right. And that's and that's what makes the business tick is is that stigma. And that stigma, if you look at it, that stigma's been going on since at least the seventies. So there's there's almost fifty straight years of wall building of people making fun of trailer parks and trailer park people. And that's what's created the opportunity was, you know, thanks to the media and Hollywood and every every show you see where the where the crazy character lives in a trailer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's still going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, even the show Myrtle Manor today. Have you ever seen Myrtle Manor? I you haven't know, seen Myrtle uh, Manor, but don't you know, know, it's a show where half the tenant base in the show doesn't have a job. Now, I never understood if you don't have a job, how you can even pay your you know your your water or sewer bill. I mean, I don't think you in the real world have people living in homes that are presentable without a job. Right. That's what Myrtle Manor tries to portray, which is because it's not in any way. I'm not even sure it's real people. I'm not sure how the show is set up. Sure, but you know the the, the 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 you know just because you're poor does not mean you are unemployed and scary and dangerous and stupid. Right. It just means you don't make a lot. And there's people who go to Harvard and the and the Harvard people that work wait tables, right? So I mean, sure. it's not like you, you, that everyone who has a low income is an idiot. Right. It, it's just that people are just afraid of that of that bottom twenty thirty percent of the U.S. population. It's like they have the plague. Yeah, I mean these so these are people. hardworking, honest people. Yeah, trying to trying to make ends meet and survive. Right, and yeah, and providing them affordable housing is an unbelievable, uh, you know, service. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, anyone on here who went to McDonald's today or Taco Bell or Arby's or any of those drive throughs and you looked at your little window to pick up your Arby's burger, you're looking right at our customers, right? You right. know, we have a ton of fast food workers. We have a ton of people who work in everything from cleaning hotel rooms to, you know, changing tires and just that. All those jobs that people don't want, right? you know, because you have to wear a dorky uniform and do nasty stuff. The, those, you know, it's crazy in America, but those people get paid a fraction of what you get paid to wear a suit and have air conditioning and, you know, have, have, have uh, you know, breakfast at Tiffany's or something. 
sure. kind, of, kind of upside down to me that digging the ditch is, pays, pays a fraction of that. Right. But th- those are our customers. You, they're everywhere. You see them yeah. every, every minute of the day. That's, yeah. I mean, I tell you what, you know, Phoenix teachers, they don't, they don't make a great wage. Absolutely. You know, it's, no, they, they, yeah. They, they, they still probably make a little, in other words, uh, t- most teachers in America, I think the median is about 40 grand. Right. So that's still more than our, our typical customer makes, has a household income of 20. 20. Okay. So what, what, what's the U.S. poverty level? Well, you know, you, I'll blow your mind with some stats here. Now, these stats came from the government, but they hate these stats, okay. right? Uh, the first stat is that that you know twenty percent of the U.S. population has a household income of twenty grand a year or less. It's actually it's like nineteen five. Twenty wow. percent. That's huge. Yeah. Because the poverty level in America for a family of four is twenty thousand. So what we're saying is roughly twenty percent of the U.S. population is in poverty. That's what if you combine those stats together, that's kind of what you get. That's then they crazy. then they came out with a, with a new stat. We said, oh, by the way, we kind of screwed up on that last stat I gave you because we kind of left off all of the folks living in America who are not U.S. citizens and therefore escaped the census. So now they're saying if you add those on and raise that number to 30% that make 20000 a year or less as a household, but you won't find them on the poverty list because since they escaped the first census stat, they therefore cannot go and get any social program help. Okay. Right? So if you're an undocumented worker then you can't go down and get food stamps and stuff, right? Right. So, so, so it's, it's a pretty big slug. It's about, about a third, roughly a third of the U.S. population is financially challenged, so, shall we say. Right. And you probably, you probably saw the stat during the Obama election that 50% of all Americans are on a social program. 50%. It's, 50% yeah. are either on Social Security or welfare or food stamps or some other government program. So this, this so is it? a massive market. Yeah, of of supplying affordable housing. But now, when you say you're providing affordable housing, you're not really going out and buying the house from those vendors. They're already no. there. That's you're right. just yeah. renting the land, which sounds well, a lot see, simpler to me than having yeah. to, to to go through that process. Yeah. See, see what what happens is the the owner of the parks dictates what the park looks like, as we control the people in the park right. under the park rules. It's a lot different than when you have a house in a subdivision. The city, I mean, if you look at your actual rules in the city, they're few and far between. Right. Right? I have a 1,000% more rules in a park, and I then basically selectively enforce those based on what that park needs to make it a functioning, happy part of society. Right. So there's some parks we don't have to even enforce rules because the people all you know, do a magnificent job of keeping up their property and everything else. And then there's other parks where seemingly nobody has the idea that it's not okay to put junk piles in your yard. <laughs> right, right. Right. So so when we're providing what we call, you know, safe, clean, quality, affordable housing, it basically means just being, we have to be like the, the uh, you know, the, the kindergarten teacher or something here that sets down the law of what you can and can't do. Right. And that applies whether whether they own their own home or if we even own the home, but that that's you know the the big the big news story people don't talk about much uh, is what what fuels the mobile home park business is the poor performance of the apartment industry. Oh, and what's going, what what goes on there right now is you know we all see Class A apartments and aren't they pretty? And look, that new one was just built and that's great and everything. But after Class A apartments get kind of old, after maybe a couple decades. They go down to Class B, and they go down to Class C. Right. Class B and Class C are those, like, guard departments that are from the 70s that you see. Class C is maybe some of the stuff in the, in the worst part of town. And those landlords do a terrible job of maintaining that stuff. Yeah. And there was an article in the Harvard Business Review recently that the reason they're doing a terrible job is it would take you 30% of the entire revenue of the complex to be reinvested continually in CapEx to maintain them. Because sure. they're falling apart, right? Sure. I mean, just like so. And and the problem is the class B and class C owners are moms and pops. So typically, the park, the, the complexes are built as class A by big companies, and then as they get old and run down, they sell them off quietly right. to moms and pops. Well, mom and pop have no money. So what happens? We have tenants come to our parks all the time that give us these stories, like I was sitting on the toilet <laughs> and I fell through the floor. Oh right? my gosh! Or my my shower hasn't worked. In two years, 
And you're like, didn't you call and tell him you need to fix it? Yeah. And he said he's going to do it. And he told us that every day for two years. So we gave up and we moved to your park. Wow. So, you know, what, what makes parks look really attractive to tenants right now is simply the apartments are so awful. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's happening. So tell me a little bit about Mobile Home University. I know, I know we're running out of time, but um, if I want to learn more about how to invest in mobile home parks, this is where I would go, correct? Yeah, well, what happened was about 20 years ago, uh, Dave and I, when we got in the industry, there was actually no one writing on the industry at all. There was no book. Right. There was nothing. And so everyone taught themselves as they went. Sure. And Dave owns the website Mobile Home Park Store, and he wanted to have a little book on there. So Dave and I wrote a book. And then we had an avalanche of people saying, we love the book, we want more. And we thought, okay, well, we can write. It's kind of fun. So we just kept writing and writing and writing. And when you when you add together 20 years of writing, you end up with this thing. We call it the home study course. It's basically about 1,000 pages long. Wow. And it tells you everything about the industry. And that's kind of become the Bible of the industry, not by design, but by default, because nobody else has ever written anything. Sure. Right. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't either if I've got this secret little niche. Well, it's, it's, it's yeah. not a secret niche because the, the, the stigma is so Yeah, huge. yeah that's true, yeah. It, there's no secret. I mean, uh, you know, if I tell a, 100 people, hey, you can make 20% a year with a park, out of 100 people, one might be brave enough to try and scale the wall, yeah. and the well, rest yeah. will just blow it off. I mean, it's the same thing with the land. Is, is I tell people I, you know, I flip land, I make 300% to 1,000%. No one believes me. Right. And uh, <laughs> so... And then, yeah, it's it's exactly. Well, I mean, we're, you know, we're we're all afraid of of the unknown, right? Right. And and you know, it's like the you know whatever is the, you know the man that first ate an oyster was a brave man indeed, or whatever that quote is. Right. I mean, you, most people they just they they like sticking in their safe zone. Sure. But the problem is, you want to make money, you typically have to get out of your safe zone. I mean, it's a, it's a choice you make, right? I mean, yeah. You can either buy blue chip stocks, or you can take a a wild flyer on a company called Apple. Yeah, something right, early yeah. days, and it's you know it's kind of like which, which do you want to do? I mean, if you're if you're looking trying to make five percent a year, then I guess stay with established junk, right? But if you want to get higher yields, you got to take risk. I mean, that, that key item from Stanford Economics one hundred and one. I mean, it's you know it's risk reward. I mean, if you take more risk, you have a higher return. Exactly, exactly. All right. Well, this is the point in the podcast where I get to put you on the spot. Okay. And ask you what is your tip. Of the week, something actionable, something that the land geek listeners can go and do today. Okay, my my tip of the week would be to read Warren Buffett's annual letter to his stockholders from this year, because if you've not read it, it talks about income real estate. So here no you have Warren kidding. Buffett, who owns no real estate inside of Berkshire Hathaway, right? And he talks at length about two things he owns. He owns a shopping center across from a college. And he owns some farmland that actually grows crops. It's a fascinating diatribe on owning income property. The part I couldn't figure out after reading it is why the heck he doesn't own more income property. Because he talks about it. It's two of his favorite investments he owns, best performing. Right. Every year, he, he wonders at the fact that he could have something that makes such a high yield, and yet he could at any moment sell it. Right. So... Well, it's uh, you know, and I was amazed it did not get more press when it came out, because it was just kind of strange that a guy who's a, who who has made a fortune in stocks and bonds writes to a group of people who invest with him in stocks and bonds about the real estate business. It just didn't even make any sense. So he he must be a huge advocate of income property because why would he devote their annual letter where they normally talk about things having to do with Berkshire Hathaway? Right. To random income properties that he owns. And the whole point of the article was to show that that's the kind of stocks he buys. But I guess my takeaway was why don't you, don't you just own more real estate if you love it so much? So It, it, might, be that, a, it might be a management issue. Yeah, it, it, I don't know. Just, But I, I suggest people read the article because yeah. if you assume he's the best investor of all time and he loves real estate, then he must know what he's talking about. Yeah, he's a genius. He's a genius. All right, well, that's great. Well, I'm definitely going to go. I can get that online? You can absolutely get it online. Absolutely, yeah. Just Google it? Just Google uh, Berkshire Hathaway uh, Letter to Investors, and it'll pop right up. All right, I'll do that. And I'll, uh, I'll link to uh, that, uh, that site on the show notes. 
So my tip of the week is going to be learn more about Frank, learn more about mobile home investing. Go to mobilehomeuniversity.com and see, you know, how to do this. If, uh, you know, just like Frank said, you know, the risk reward ratio and you've got, I mean, if you're listening to this podcast, you're already that kind of person that buys into alternative investments. I mean, the average person, I tell them I buy and sell raw land, their eyes immediately glaze over and then that's, that's the end of the conversation. So um, check it out, mobilehomeuniversity.com. Uh, Frank, are we good? Is there anything else you want to talk about? Well, you know, I, I would also invite people as a, as, a, as a minor action step. When you're out driving down the road and you drive by a mobile home park, just turn into it. It's okay. not illegal. You can just take a drive, take a left, go in that thing. It might help you scale that giant wall. It might give you a ladder to get you over the wall if you actually looked inside a park. So many people who tell me, oh, my God, parks are terrible. Oh, my God, how can you be in that? I'm like, have you ever been in one? No. <laughs> Right, right. Go, go look. Go look in one. I'm, see, I'm, see, I'm see guilty. If it scares you. It doesn't scare me at all. I mean, yeah. The 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 myth is way bigger than the reality. All right, great. Well, uh, I want to remind everybody: learn more. Go to www.thelandgeek.com. Download for free the Passive Income Blueprint. Get the ebook: How to Avoid the Three Fatal Land Buying Mistakes. And of course, always get this informative and engaging podcast. Delivered each week to your email inbox. I want to thank you again, Frank, uh, for taking uh, thank, valuable thank time out of your day to uh, enlighten uh, my listeners about what you do and how you do it. And this was really a phenomenal podcast, and I can't thank you enough. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me, Mark. All right, thanks, Frank. Um, and uh, we'll see everybody next week. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Land Geek. Join us next time for more tips, secrets, and information that will help you succeed. Stay connected with The Land Geek on Facebook at facebook.com slash thelandgeek.